If you have been using Scrum for a while now and you feel it has not quite yet delivered on all of the promises you heard when you first started, you are not crazy, you are definitely not alone, and your story is actually a cautionary tale about the hype versus the reality of what it takes to become more agile. Maybe you are a scrum master at a crossroads in your career. Maybe you're a manager who bet on scrum to solve your team problems. You would be in good company because scrum represents 87% of the market in terms of agile framework, whether you use scrum itself or a scrum based framework at scale like less or Nexus or safe. But despite its widespread adoption, why so many teams still struggle to achieve all of that agility, all the promised benefits of Scrum. Let's jump into the five most common fail promises of Scrum and the real world impact that they have on teams and organizations. Twice the amount of work in half the time. Really? That's the name of the book Jeff Sutherland, the co-creator of Scrum, wrote in 2014. I think it's one of the worst marketing approaches ever, like old 1990s Lee sales slogan. What's the problem with that? First, this promise sets unrealistic expectations and instead of twice of the work in half the time, what I have seen in most of the places I've come to coach is three or four times more pressure to deliver and none of the support required to run Scrum successfully. We see quality dropping, we see burnout and stress. When an executive or a manager reads the title of this book, they will buy into the sort of hype and decide that they have to have Scrum in their organization without fully understanding the implications of providing the necessary underlying conditions for Scrum success. But let's assume they wanted to offer all the support. I always assume good intent and most executives and managers are willing to. Well, Scrum doesn't teach you how. It doesn't give you the tactics for improving, for example, speed of delivery. It doesn't let you know much more than work on an ordered backlog and stay focused during a sprint. Yes, but how? Scrum also won't tell executives how they must show up and how they should support their teams. In fact, Scrum doesn't talk at all about what needs to change in the higher layers of the organization or as far as management practices. If you've heard of value streams, attending to flow, controlling lead time, continuous integration, none of that can be learned via Scrum. Yet those are the concepts and the tactics that can actually help you double your speed for real, which means without sacrificing quality and maintaining a sustainable pace. Now here is another Scrum big promise, happier customers. But let's be realistic here. Have you actually seen a significant improvement in customer satisfaction as a result of solely implementing Scrum? I'm not talking about team happiness. I mean the customer at the very end of the line. Scrum promises to deliver happier customers. Now, Scrum suggests that by running rapid iterations called sprints and by hosting reviews with customers, you can involve them early and often, collecting feedback and getting the product out of the door faster. The idea is great, some of it works. The reality can be a bit impractical though, at least in the way that it's conceived in Scrum. Your sprint reviews, what happened there is that we see managers and we see other teams attending if at all, while well, actual customers are often unavailable, but sometimes even uninterested in attending these rather frequent meetings. They have something else to do, or they are somehow far removed from your team to care. Gathering customer feedback requires varied techniques, like iterating, serving, and even coding to discover trends and the needs as the customer is using the product, none of which are addressed by Scrum. These are engineering practices. It's easy to say that the customer will be pleased by inspecting the product increment, but the reality is much more complex. So there are two issues here. One 
is that Scrum's promise of faster delivery and more frequent releases via sprints is supposed to lead to happier customers. It is an assumption that falls short because more often than not, we might be speeding up our delivery process without actually developing speed as a capability, which means that quality shouldn't suffer as a result. So what happens is that we are showing the customer more often stuff that is incomplete and with more bugs than the customer would need to see. In the end, it's not about having a lot of feedback, but it's about having the right type of feedback and timely feedback. Second, generating value involves multiple stakeholders, not just the customers. We love the customer. They, they may think they know what they want though, but they are not always right. They might not be aware of, uh, or maybe even be unconcerned about crucial aspects of the system that have a significant impact on the final product in the end. Next, we have the failed promise of productive work. Scrum is really said that by operating in sprints, in fostering collaboration with achieve productive work, this is an important duel. But what actually happens? I can tell you from my experienced coaching teams, they say it often feels like they're stuck in a perpetual cycle of back-to-back -back meetings, which the expectation that every second week, because most sprints somehow are magically two weeks, we can then request yet another big batch of features. Adding to that, in this collaboration style, everyone is expected to talk to everyone a little bit more than they would wish otherwise on a daily basis. While collaboration is crucial for most agile teams, this overly synchronous approach is honestly not appropriate for software development, and it overlooks especially the unique challenges of distributed teams, which, let's face it, make up the most, the biggest majority of software development teams today. What distributed teams need are great dashboards and streamlined communication channels, not more meetings. Oh, and they need a lot of focused time where people can put their heads in the sand and code away their features. Another issue with this promise can be the fact that by using Scrum to the team, we are dictating that the development cycle must fit neatly into the sprint's length, regardless of the complexity or the difficulty of the requirements in the task at hand. The sprint ends up being nothing more than this artificial deadline that we all dread. A sad reality is that I've seen people engage in those infinite discussions about irrelevant problems that they did not have before Scrum was implemented. Like when they keep worrying about how long the daily Scrum should be and what is or isn't in the role of the product owner, a role that they've never had before in the first place. No matter the work that you do, not everything will fit specific lengths of time. And no matter the work you do, you don't need to collaborate all the time for successful delivery of great products. I hope I am shedding some light on why these are failed promises, because Scrum alone shouldn't be making these promises in the first place. I've hinted at that at several previous videos. Now, there is a lot more that I can say about how you effectively counteract and manage these failed promises and more. In fact, that's the job of coaching agile teams and their leaders, right? So if this specific type of content is what you want to know more, leave a comment uh, with more details. I'd love to know. Now, I'll spend a bit more time dissecting this one. Can teams truly self-organize? Maybe. If they decide to not use Scrum, can they really do that? I bet they cannot, right? The truth is that there are always constraints to how much teams can self-organize. One example, Scrum advocates for team decision-making, yet I would personally argue from the companies I've worked for um, that teams cannot make decisions in all circumstances that are more than valid reasons for teams to maybe be allowed um, to present options with the final decision resting in the hands of the managers. I argue that many teams don't even want to make certain decisions. They just want to code their products and deliver great quality or 
They want decision making, but when it's about something rather technical. Another example? Of course, we should all understand where our customers come from and what they want from the products we create. That's a given, right? But we already have a product owner and then we have marketing people, salespeople, business people, and many more stakeholders looking at that aspect. Now, who else, however, is looking at the aspect of great technology behind the way we service our customers? You guessed it, only the technical team. This is a disservice that I particularly feel about Scrum implementation bringing, especially to software development teams. Developers should indeed understand their customers and should create the best product possible. But let's not forget that their focus and their superpower is rather technical. That's what they bring to the table. Being technical is how developers serve their customers. How often do you see product owners, for example, reluctant at a team when they advocate for more time for reaching better quality or for more time for paying off technical debt? Yet, Scrum Playbook has zero words on how to improve the much needed technical excellence. Have you ever met a couple of developers that did not trust the Scrum Master, whether that was you or someone else? Have you seen developers raging about how magnificent and powerful Scrum is? Then you get what I'm saying. Teams can and should self-organize about what they control and master. In this example would be in the whole aspect of software production and delivery. They are constrained about other aspects in the organization as far as the product goes, and this is normal. As a coach, I would reset the expectations with the team so that people are not left feeling like they could have a saying on everything in the organization. A certain level of compartmentalization allows for people to be very good at what they do. And it is by partnering together with clear interfaces and attending to constraints that they can operate at their best sustainable pace. Before we close this video, the final failed promise I want to mention is that Scrum hints at predictability, predictable delivery through short iterations, your sprint. But is that predictability? That's predictability about when to have a sprint review, all right? But the Scrum guide will tell you Sprints enable predictability by ensuring inspection and adaptation of progress towards a product goal at least every calendar month. But predictability is not inspection against a goal. It's important to know your definitions. Predictability is about being able to tell when something will be done given a certain percentage of confidence, like saying, I'm 70% confident that we'll hit our target date of May 1st. This sort of thing has a name and it's called probabilistic forecasting. A famous approach would be the Monte Carlo simulation, which is a mathematical technique that predicts possible outcomes for an uncertain event. Computer programs use this method to analyze past data and predict a range of future outcomes based on a choice of action. This is a more scientific, reliable, and interesting approach to predictability. And folks like Troy McGinnis and Tanya Vacanti have both documentation and products on the matter, so I will not go further on this specific topic. I will just summarize that you can achieve predictability if you can keep track of units of work, use the stories, tasks, whatever name you give to things, and the time they've taken to be completed historically. Running sprints in itself does nothing for forecasting or predictability. You could maybe put a rule that a release must happen by the end of every sprint. That is great news, but there is no guarantee that each release will add up to the scope you want in the timeline you desire. So in that sense, it's a scrum failed promise because it's kind of an empty promise. If we are to go beyond Scrum promises and consider some practical aspects of Scrum implementations though, how are you feeling about retrospectives? Because that is for sure a misunderstood practice all around. So much so that I see managers call that the um, fun meeting for the team. 
I see teams that try to get out of it by asking to skip it just this time. And I have obviously the Scrum Master always desperate looking for the next engaging template in hopes to have the team love the retrospective event in Scrum. Well, if you feel like it, or if you heard that retrospectives in some way are a waste of time, you'll love the next video coming up and it will be a series and it'll be appearing here starting next week. If however, you're curious about the limitations of agile frameworks, this one is for you. Mm -hmm.